Uh, good afternoon, one and all. I welcome all to session number nine on IPR licensing do's and don'ts by Ms. Polomi Ghosh. Uh, I would like to give introduction to uh, Polomi, madam. Uh, she is an IP and commercialization consultant. Ma'am is a certified licensing professional and is involved into taking ideas to market through IP and technology transfer. Professionally, she has more than 16 years of experience in intellectual property rights with organizations like Ranbaxy and Actavis. Academically, she is a postgraduate in organic chemistry and has LLB degree. Her responsibilities include startup creation and support, negotiation of IP license agreement, technology scouting and assessment of the invention from IP and business perspective, managing commercial research and enterprise projects, IP portfolio management of City, University of London. She's involved with commercial licensing activities, spin out social enterprise formation, ra raising awareness of commercial and legal matters in research with students and academic staff, and contribution to decision making and awareness raising about technology transfer and IP commercialization. I welcome Ms. Paolami Ghosh, ma'am, to throw light and enlighten us with the different aspects of intellectual property right. Welcome, ma'am. Hi, thank you, Harshil. Uh, thanks uh, for the uh, lovely um, introduction. And um, I'm so very happy to be among you all and uh, um, have a discussion on the IP licensing. And it's uh, a very core area that I work on. And um, as I was telling, uh, I would like the in, uh, interaction to be a bit, uh, uh, I mean, uh, interactive. So uh, please raise your hands or um, I would have some questions might be. We would really like appreciate if you can uh, post your answer in the uh, chat box. So um, yeah, uh, it would be lovely to start. Um, is my screen visible? Oh, yes, ma'am. So uh, thanks again for this uh, opportunity to come and uh, share my uh, experience with you all. And uh, I hope to give an insight of the work that uh, I do. Uh, I come from, uh, um, I work with an academic institution similar to yours. So there would be many similarities that you will find uh, in the the way the work uh, happens and um, also might be, I'll, uh, I will say from a perspective of a business perspective, but of course, a lot of academic uh, insight is inbuilt in this uh, presentation. So it's afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'd like to um, take you through this journey. So um, you can see a teapot. So, of course, uh, I hope that all of you are sitting with a cup of tea. I have mine here. So a lot can hap uh, happen over a cup of coffee. So uh, I would really, um, this is uh, one of the recent uh, photos when uh, we went to Yorkshire and uh, early morning, a beautiful sight. But uh, what stuck with me was um, a lot can, a lot of IP is in, to, in, the, uh, in a cup of tea. So uh, to start with, I would really uh, want you all to uh, explore a bit uh, your imagination and think uh, what type of IP do you think a cup of uh, coffee or a tea, uh, rather let's stick to uh, tea, uh, can have. So uh, please put your finger onto the chat window and uh, if we can uh, have a bit of uh, answers over there, it would be really nice. So what I mean is how much intellectual property is there in a cup of tea? So you can uh, think from the start of how a tea is brewed to that point when it comes to the uh, teapot. So all those uh, process has a bit of IP in it, uh, as I see from an IP perspective. Uh, I would really like to like you to explore that. So um, how about I get some answers over here? Do you want me to start? So what all IP can uh, you find in a cup of tea? Come on. So how about, uh, have you seen nowadays um, the uh, instant tea bags, which comes in different uh, shapes and size. So a design patent can be there. 
So that type of thing I'm looking forward to. So just use the imagination. I see somebody has told about the uh, quality, quality check process. Of course, flavors, yes, yes, that's good. Tea making process, yes, of course. Uh, different type of tea making process can be there. We have nowadays lots of uh, different type of infused teas. Yes, ge geographical indication for tea. We know about the uh, uh, tandoori chai. That's that's quite. I would like to like to really try. Design patents, right? Trade secret, well done. Process patent, well done. Yes, yes. Wow, you all have a very good grip on the intellectual property. Rasgulla chai. No. <laughs> We'll see. I don't know. Activities in extract. Wow, that that can be a form of concentration of activities in extract. That can be a, some form of process patent. Product patent. I doubt it because uh, tea in itself is quite well known. So uh, in that case, I I, I doubt uh, where you can get a product patent that way. But processes, brewing process. Um, and uh, different types of flavors, yes, yes. So I'll go to the next slide and uh, I'll show you. This is um, this is what. Uh, sorry. This is this was a post from Intel uh, WIPO, which is uh, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization on a uh, uh, on the um, International Tea Day or Intellectual Property Day, and they. Uh, yeah, they they did uh, talk about a lot about uh, um, sorry. So a lot of it is uh, in the um, in the form of uh, you can patent the tea related to uh, tea making processes. A lot can be in the form of trade secrets, like somebody mentioned about flavors might be a bit on the trade secrets. Designs, uh, as I was talking about, the triangle shape of the uh, PGT uh, tea particular brand. And uh, trademarks, of course, we relate to the trademarks and uh, like uh, the Darjeeling tea, somebody talked about the geographical indication that we have in the, uh, the, um, in the Darjeeling tea or Nilgiri's tea. Or uh, when we talk about the uh, trademark, again, uh, we relate to a particular brand, like if we, are, uh, if we like something uh, and we know the taste of it, we try to retain that. So uh, this is just to give an insight like how much uh, uh, there is uh, even in uh, things that are very uh, uh, near us and still we do not uh, actually uh, observe that how much IP is over there. So my uh, I, I want to cover uh, a bit on the IP whole life cycle of it and um, with of course the emphasis on the licensing module and when, what and where, what you can license. And uh, uh, I brought you case studies, um, a bit on the license agreement we will be going through and uh, what we call as a post license case. So license is just a start. So after license also a lot of work is there and um, that needs to be uh, a part of the whole learning process of how we uh, nurture IP and commercialize it. Um, so um, this, we we actually uh, similar to the IP scenario we saw in a cup of tea. There are so much of IP uh, that is around us, and uh, uh, knowingly, unknowingly, we are a part of it. Just for example, the case of the COVID vaccines, we know we are leaving it rather, to be very frank. Now going through the, all the scenarios, and uh, a lot of universities actually are uh, um, are where the IP is generated and slowly the whole uh, process of uh, like you must have uh, gone to the uh, um, earlier sessions where you have read how the uh, or you have um, learned about how the IP moves from the university to a commercial setting. So similar to the uh, in the COVID vaccines also we see that uh, 
Ox, uh, the invention from Oxford has moved from Oxford through uh, AstraZeneca in the form of the Covishield vaccine, which is like you have the patents, you have the trademark, you have a commercial entity which helping as a vehicle to uh, uh, propel it further. We have the BioNTech, where also I think uh, BioNTech, which is a spin out from a German university, they developed, uh, they partnered with Pfizer and uh, that vaccine is there. We have the Moderna vaccine, which came out of the University of Pennsylvania. So here, uh, a lot of uh, IP uh, and licensing uh, has happened and which has moved from the university to uh, the commercial sector. Um, uh, when I was trying to find cases to uh, just to, uh, to, to union, like how IP licensing is quite relevant to our everyday life, I found the case of Thomas Edison, where he was quite inventors and uh, um, he invented uh, and uh, also filed patents and uh, out of uh, those, uh, not all were uh, very successful, but at least there were cases of 20 patents or uh, that he uh, either sold or licensed out to industries. And in a way, when he sold the monetary returns that he got of it, it got invested into the um, into their other projects. So. It's quite uh, um, uh, to, in a cycle, you can say the licensing brings in some revenues, which again gets invested and produces inventions and again uh, completes a cycle. Um, uh, we have cases of um, in the, I think now the crickets and uh, all the uh, sports, uh, the brands are of great value. Uh, so the IPL brand valued around 5.3 billion. So there is, of course, a case of uh, the brand uh, licensing that is there. And uh, we all relate to all these brands, but uh, we do not uh, think from the perspective of the licensing that has gone behind it and how much revenue that has created. Um, uh, since I have a small daughter, I know this Chota being she was very, uh, very interested about this program. Recently, it's coming in Netflix. So there is uh, some form of licensing that has gone into there. So uh, it's moving from the TV platform to uh, OTP platform. And um, so uh, there are other brands also that I have uh, found uh, Delhi Daredevil who also uh, get a lot of revenue licensing their uh, their brand as a merchandise, which is uh, coming up quite a lot. You will see celebrities uh, starting their own brands. So uh, there's somewhere the trademark licenses that is going into it. The main aspect of here to see that there is more to licensing than meets our everyday uh, eyes. So we knowingly, unknowingly uh, become a part of the whole thing. Um, IP life cycle or innovation, you can also call it, uh, like uh, invention is somewhere the, a phase where uh, um, idea generation happened. Being in the lab, I think every day you are, um, you come across a lot of uh, ideas that you feel can have applicability, but not all ideas go into the market and become product. There, there is a whole cycle, and it's not, uh, it's it's not like sometimes it's say that to raise a child you need a village. So it's something like that. For a, a successful commercialization, it's not only the responsibility of the academic; it's a responsibility of the institution. It's a responsibility of the policy that is in place. It's a responsibility of the uh, incentivization that the academic gets in order to um, have that uh, push. Uh, to actually um, get this invention formulated into a product. So, uh, of course, uh, in the invention stage, we are inventing a product. We are trying to see what's the applicability or we start a bit earlier looking into the reviews, what is already there in place and then formulating what we want to do, uh, whether it's a cure that we are looking for or it's a um, molecule that we are looking for or uh, a solution to a problem. Like uh, you might have heard a lot about the uh, problem solution approach these days that is suggested for any uh, startups or even from for academia also. So uh, now uh, we have a solution to a problem. Now what needs to be done? So uh, you can publish it right away that most of the I, I, when I talk to academics, they say that oh, we are in the research field. We we try to 
uh, give uh, or publish whatever we have researched and that is for the um, overall humanities uh, uh, or you say good uh, but i would uh, really like to uh, I mean, it's, it's of course good that you uh, the publication is important uh, because uh, um, the the taxpayers' money is invested. And uh, but at the same time, if uh, there is a company or an industry or a collaborator who actually wants to work with academics and to take it forward, because uh, industries are far more better placed to take any product to the market than uh, universities are because the resources are limited, the funding is limited. And uh, so to make the or add value to our invention, uh, I often suggest that IP protection is quite vital. So you, you don't have to go and file a patent always, uh, but uh, patents uh, have the highest, or as we call, it's a very hard IP, so uh, all, everyone values it. So, and uh, also you get some time, like when you file a patent, you get a year time, most of the countries where you can file, com file the complete. So this one year is a period where you can develop the product further, test it, and take a decision whether you want to file uh, the complete or not. During this one year period, uh, the patent is not in the public domain and you can abandon the patent over there if you do not want to uh, go ahead with the complete. Uh, and it takes another uh, six months, like from the very beginning to the publication, at least 18 months you get so that uh, you can test your product and you can uh, see how valuable you think uh, it's for the market. So uh, having some form of protection in place and uh, uh, that's quite uh, good. And uh, as I told, patent is, uh, is a patents are hard IPs, but you can think about uh, copyrights like the uh, or trade secrets or know how, like the inventions that you make. You usually have a logbook where you are writing down what is happening, what is not. So all the failures that you have encountered can be uh, a very vital piece of information because that can save somebody's time or can give a competitive edge to somebody, uh, some other company who is starting from the uh, very first tape and uh, that can buy them time. Or you can develop a project that uh, and have a brand name. Usually, I don't know uh, about here, but uh, I have seen academics very, uh, very passionate about acronyms. So we have projects of different form of acronym. At times, I don't understand how it relates to the project. Uh, so those type of act, but it becomes an acronym and people become uh, uh, accustomed to that project with that acronym. So that can be developed into a trademark or uh, have some uh, valuable brand value. So there are different type of protection. I would, uh, of course, um, encourage to talk to somebody who are in the IPR field. Uh, somebody who is a friend of the um, uh, university, like uh, we have Mr. Vijay from Patlex, who had been quite helpful in uh, in uh, discussing all these aspects of the IPR. So uh, after the protection stage comes uh, the commercialization. So uh, though it's a um, cycle, it doesn't mean that each one of them are in isolation. So they all go together in uh, time. Uh, commercialization is a time when uh, the academic or somebody helping them in the business uh, tries to find out what's the business applicability. As I have told before the invention is made, there is uh, some business aspects already there because you are trying to uh, solve a problem somewhere. So the commercialization is a state uh, when uh, the business aspects or the market aspects, like how big is the market, uh, what, where, who are the per people who are working and in this field and who can actually utilize this or who would be interested to take it forward. And uh, during this commercialization phase, the uh, licensing uh, concept comes. And uh, once uh, or uh, you form a spin out or you collaborate, there are different forms you can talk about um, the licensing. Uh, models uh, and uh, then whatever revenue you get out of it, it can be reinvested for investments. So just to give a um, uh, recent day, I was reading somewhere um, there, there was a, a lab called the Bell Labs, uh, I think, and uh, they were uh, R&D center and it was acquired by uh, Nokia. 
and uh, it was originally founded by Alexander Graham Bell and uh, through their uh, many years of collaboration with the industry say or their work they have uh, they are credited to have built up this uh, laser transistor solar cells so uh, this is how uh, the whole process of the ip uh, life cycle uh, can be formulated Um, I have added a slide here uh, to uh, to uh, what do you say have a visual feel of how a commercialization uh, whole process of comm IP commercialization moves. So uh, it, there is the technology stage where the idea is created. Then uh, there is some form of uh, validation that is happening. Then you form a prototype, which is then tested, and uh, then it uh, it's launched in the commercial arena. Uh, there is a concept in uh, here about the TRLs or technology readiness level. So from the um, TRL zero or one, when is when it is the technology is uh, conceptualized and uh, TRL seven or eight when it is uh, going out into the market. So this whole stage is um, you cannot again do in isolation. It has to be a, uh, a it has to be a um, activity of uh, the academics, the business uh, laid person, the universities. Um, uh, what do you say the vision uh, how they want the commercialization to happen and at the uh, same time uh, the commercialization uh, like uh, the first um, the first is the technology development uh, phase and the second that I have shown is the commercialization stage where we do the market analysis we uh, talk to uh, different uh, people who is working in this area to understand what value or technology of this aspects uh, has then uh, there is the market evaluation or validation and uh, at the same time uh, the product is then uh, worked uh, with um, uh, different uh, collaborators and uh, tested uh, uh, like few products, especially in the medical fraternity, they would need some form of certification or if it's a drug, uh, a medicine that you are getting uh, developing, then the approval process is of course a long, uh, long line of approval process that needs or stages of approval is treated. So this uh, two process, though they look so linear, is never so linear. And uh, when we are doing the whole commercialization process, it's a very non-linear process where uh, continuous back and forth movement happens. So in the, if, if I can just give you an overview, like when the academic comes with the invention, then there are somebody like the IPR personnel or a business personnel who will look into the aspects of what the invention is, what the market is. They will assess it. If there is some feedback, that will uh, it will go to the academic or uh, it would be an action on some, somebody else to look into. Then there would be some support provided so that uh, there is development further because uh, without funding nothing moves uh, and funding is quite scarce uh, and i think as few, one of my though this term of value of death is very prevalent in the startup world but i think in the academia also when we are trying to commercialize within the university uh, staying within the university this value of death is faced even more where the um, for an academic to put it to the next stage uh, you need funding and we have to wait for the funding, whether it's a government funding or there is a um, collaborator who is happy to invest and take it forward. So um, just to give an overview, it's it's never a, a straightforward process. It's an iterative process, continuously going back and forth, and it can take five to ten years also to commercialize an idea from an idea to um, the whole process uh, of com uh, bringing it to the market. So. It's uh, it's never uh, it, it's exciting. It never uh, it's never a dull moment, uh, but at the same time you need a lot of patience. And uh, if there is a patent that is helpful, because of course you get a somehow uh, you can exclude somebody other someone else for 20 years to not to uh, exploit your product. Uh, but uh, as I say, patent is the not the only way. And um, so before publication might be it would it is worth to uh, talk to uh, your. 
commercial, uh, whoever is there, or the head of the department to see uh, how they uh, think about your invention and, uh, and have a strategy in place so that uh, this whole life cycle of the IP can be monitored and uh, there can be uh, some form of commercialization in the end. Um, to talk about the route, of the com route to commercialization, uh, there are broadly three aspects that we consider. Uh, one is the, um, it can be the IP cell or assignments where you assign the right uh, to, uh, of, a, of your intellectual property that has been generated to somebody else. Um, just to give you an analogy, think about a house. So you own a house. Uh, if you are uh, selling the house to somebody, so you do not uh, have ownership to it, once you sell it, uh, that somebody takes it up and does whatever he wants to do with it, and you you may get a uh, amount for selling that to that person. Uh, that's uh, it, that's the sale or the assignment of IP. It happens in the similar way because IP is also considered as a though it's an intangible asset, but it has that value of property uh, or it has the same credibility. It has the legality of uh, buying and selling it. Uh, IP licensing again, um, it's um, it's giving the right or permission to somebody to uh, use your intellectual property. Again, coming to the analogy of the house, uh, you are renting it out to somebody, and um, and uh, they are giving you a, a regular rent. Uh, that's the same concept in the IP licensing. You are giving a permission for somebody to use your license, uh, uh, intellectual property, and you are getting uh, value out of it. And startup creation is like, it's a form of uh, some aspects of licensing is there. But uh, when we say that uh, the university spins out the company, in this, uh, they, the university in their interest uh, puts the intellectual property in a private limited company. The university may have a stakeholder in the company. That's where the definition of spin outs come. So we uh, where the university, it's a very uh, general definition where the university holds the shareholding in the company, uh, then it is called a spin out. And if the uh, academic thinks of uh, starting it separately, then it's a startup and uh, you can negotiate a license deal with the university to see um, how you can uh, um, take it forward. So these are the very, uh, very broad aspects of the IP commercialization, but uh, you can have, um, especially uh, these days uh, after the COVID, uh, we have seen that there has been a lot of, um, what do you say, uh, open licenses. So universities or companies have come forward where they thought that this type of license will uh, really he be helpful for, uh, for eradicating this uh, difficult scenario all of us are where, where or are in. So there, there can be a way of commercializing in that way where it might be it's an open license without any uh, revenue or without any fee attached to it. Then again, we, uh, we have uh, companies or uh, uh, or institution, you can say, who uh, um, I do not know if you have heard about them. They are called patent trolls in very colloquial language, or they are called non-practicing entities who hold a lot of patents but are not interested to actually use them. Instead, they want to license them, and uh, that's their business model. So that's another way of commercialization. Uh, few. Um, Academics, uh, sorry, not ac universities are quite uh, infamous or famous for that type of provision. And uh, then um, also you have the creative common commercialization licenses when we see a lot in the um, copyright sectors. And um, also, uh, okay, I wanted to touch upon franchising also, which is uh, a part of the IP license or trademark license. I'll cover it in when I go to uh, the other sections. I am sure I have covered over there. So the the basic, uh, very broad as uh, rules of commercialization are the IP sale, uh, IP licensing, startup creation, collaboration. Also, you can talk to a certain extent where the academics uh, or uh, the labs collaborates with industry and at times industry funds their PhD programs or uh, or some studentship and they together try to find solution to a problem or uh, there is something that is um, that they get out of that. 
Um, so we have been talking about licenses quite for some time now. So uh, what, do you, what is a license? Um, we uh, get into the concept of driving license. We have come across so many times. I mean, most of us who drive, we know that uh, it's essential. Uh, it's a different type of license where the authority is uh, taking uh, some test and uh, giving you that assertion of that, OK, you can drive and you can go ahead. So that's very valuable, of course. And uh, we, uh, whenever we uh, download a, a software knowingly or not knowingly, we click on that I agree terms and conditions. So that is uh, where somewhere we are actually agreeing to the terms and conditions that the software provider is uh, implementing on us. So, so uh, the whole process, it's uh, license is uh, a document that uh, shows that uh, the license or the, or the one who holds the uh, intellectual property or any rights uh, is giving you permission to use theirs uh, to, uh, to, for purposes that you want. Uh, on the basis of terms and conditions that are in the agreements that follows. So basically in a very nutshell, it's a, a license or a permission to do uh, something that uh, that is uh, um, actually um, that is actually given uh, in the license agreement. So to give an analogy, um, say a um, university has some patents on battery technology and uh, they are uh, they have filed some patents and they they have developed the technology to a certain extent and uh, a car manufacturer is interested to uh, to use that in the uh, and uh, because uh, we know that slowly we are moving towards electric car and they would like to um, implement it into their uh, cars and they are uh, they want to take a license they want to have that permission to use that technology in their cars to build a product that they can sell in the market. So this uh, this is a good uh, example where uh, we can see that the, uh, it has moved from the university to the uh, academic, uh, sorry, the, from the academic scenario to the commercial scenario and the license is the bridge that uh, helps the technology to move at the same time, see that there is some uh, value that is gained uh, by the institution. Um, next, uh, we will have a look why licensing is uh, important. So um, I might have asked this question to all of you, uh, but anyway, the slide shows it all. So. Um, uh, it basically, uh, as again, coming back to the tech, the analogy that I gave about the cars, uh, so they could have developed it uh, or the university was developing it. It could have developed it further, put it in the car, done all the um, process or the certification that is required. Uh, but they were not interested because it would have been quite a lot of investment and I'm not sure the university would have seen uh, that type of investment of possible or they could have uh, seen it as a risk. Instead, it was, uh, it was easier for them to license it to this automobile company who were already placed in the market. They were bringing the electric car in the market and uh, so there was a shared risk over here and uh, so the risk was... Uh, I think most of the university are risk uh, resilience and um, and this way uh, that helps in reducing the risk. Revenue generation, uh, again, uh, since this license have been uh, provided to the, um, sorry, since the license uh, have uh, been taken up by the automobile company, they would be uh, providing uh, some revenue and uh, some benefic benefits to the university and that will create some revenue generation that can be invested further in the uh, research lab that uh, produce that those patented technology or it can be uh, used centrally for uh, developing further work. Increasing market penetration. Uh, this might not be very relevant for the university licensing but for companies which are uh, using intellectual property licensing uh, this is quite relevant where say a company which is functioning in India wants to explore uh, in European countries or the Middle East or the South Asia, Southeast Asian countries. So for them to go and uh, set up a business and understand the local scenario, 
uh, and uh, start from scratch. It is quite uh, quite a investment and a difficult uh, at times. Uh, instead, uh, if they collaborate with a company which is already which has a foot foothold in t- in these con- other countries, then it's um, easier. Uh, so uh, this Indian based company can give a license to those European countries. Uh, and they can sell in those countries or develop the product in those countries. In this way, they are increasing their market penetration. So licensing, they are not giving up. This company has not given up their IP. They have just given the permission to another company to use their IP. So here, uh, this is why the, some peop- some companies are uh, choose to license. Then, um, then uh, of course, uh, here multinational or open innovation can be uh, their new marketing uh, strategies can help uh, or why they need to license this technology. Redu- reducing the costs. So for, uh, again, coming back to the battery technology that we were talking, the car, um, the automobile company might have uh, R&D, but at the same time, the it, it involves a lot of investment in the R&D to build a product. But uh, while scouting for technology, if they have found that this university has developed this uh, patented technology that is quite good, and uh, then the automobile uh, company would not invest that much in the uh, industry. Instead, they will take a license from the uh, university and uh, develop it further within their uh, R&D. So that has actually uh, reduce the cost of the whole um, process. That saves time, uh, 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 time is money somewhere. So if you are competitive and you can bring a product into the market before your competitors, then of course it was saving time and money. And also uh, license uh, helps in collaboration also. So today might be they are, uh, there is one uh, license uh, that has taken place, but tomorrow the, uh, the parties can collaborate together on a project or they can together apply for a grant and uh, then uh, there can be a, a line of products that can come out. So again, there is a concept of licensing in and licensing out. So for licensing out, of course, the examples that I have been giving, it's all about licensing out where the university licenses out uh, to the company. Uh, whereas if you take the example of the automobile company, they are licensing in the technology where they are uh, taking a license from a, another entity and uh, building it inside uh, further. Uh, but again, when they are building it further, it has to be in the license agreement, uh, what they are allowed and what they are not allowed to do. Hope uh, this is uh, clear. So I'm happy to take any question if there is any so what can we license? I think a lot of us uh, have the notions that patents only can be licensed. So it's not always true. Uh, I have given you a few examples and also later on I'll take you through some of the uh, other examples where it is like uh, there is a various things that you can, of course, patents being the uh, m- most, uh, as we call it, the uh, hard IP. It uh, people prefers if there is a patent because it adds some weird value. Uh, as it's true for all the intellectual property rights, these are rights that are not. These are uh, what is exclusive rights rather than inclusive rights in the sense that you do not gain any anything that way from it. But what you do with the IP is that you exclude somebody else to use yours without your permission. So. Th- so the patent that way adds value. Uh, at times, the patents and the trade secrets are said to be the uh, different faces of the same coin. So the patent gives you a um, protection of 20 years. And um, after that 20 years, um, it's anyway in the public domain and everybody can use it. And at times for pharmaceuticals, we have seen that a lot of time actually uh, is lost when we are doing when they are doing all those clinical trials or the minimum basic that is required to bring the product to the market. And only might be they are getting five to 10 years to commercialize it and you do not get uh, the whole amount back that you have been invested. On the other side, for trade secrets, if we I'm sure that everybody has given the example of Coca-Cola because that's the biggest example of trade secrets that we have. So trade secrets, on the other hand, is like it can't be forever if you can have measures in place. 
and uh, then that can be again licensed uh, and um, that can be a good model for licensing again. Uh, if uh, we can see for the KFC, KFC, I have been, I mean, I they do not have patents that way. So a lot of their trade secrets uh, is, um, I mean, their IP is in the trade secrets. And we see a lot of uh, franchise model that they uh, built their business on where uh, they have uh, the same feel and look of the product. Uh, of course, the chicken or whatever the the spices they have used, that's a trade secret. And uh, that's what you can license. Uh, regulatory files, uh, that's a very, uh, very uh, good things to uh, that uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, license at times. Trademarks, we see a lot of examples where uh, trademarks um, are licensed. Uh, in this, uh, I would like to mention that uh, when we talk about IP licensing, there are very broad categories. Uh, there's, nothing is watertight, of course. So uh, we have the technology licenses, and I think most of my uh, area of uh, work is technology licensing. Then there is the merchandise uh, licensing, which is the, that those type of brand uh, mer uh, or trademark licensing. And there is the copyright uh, licensing or where uh, you find the books, and the movies coming out. So there are a bit of uh, broad categorization and they, each of these sectors have a different aspect of licensing, uh, which is very uh, crucial to that uh, sector. Then, uh, of course, um, copyright, uh, you, you can license your work. Uh, or the manuals. Uh, to give you an example, we have a um, uh, in the uh, in in the school of um, this is called the school of midwifery. So they are midwives who uh, helps in uh, who, whose research areas is how to uh, start midwifery units. Uh, that is where you can go for natural birth. So they have produced this uh, manual of uh, how to set up a, a midwifery unit, what are the essential leadership qualities that you need, what, what has to be done, what cannot be done. And this manual actually they are licensing out. So that type of thing also can be licensed. Then uh, questionnaires uh, for clinical trials, I have seen that type of uh, or uh, when you have um, what do you say in the uh, corporate world, some type of questionnaire to assess uh, different type of uh, processes. Those type of uh, products are under copyright protection and they can be licensed and they, they are revenue generating. Coming to business model, I think McDonald's or Cafe Coffee Day are very uh, big examples of uh, this type of business model where uh, we see uh, that not only the brand name has been licensed, but how you are doing the business, how the store would look like, or um, um, basically everything about that, uh, or uh, uh, as I talked about the franchisee model, where uh, how you are operating the whole business, uh, that can be also licensed. Uh, when can you license? This is a very important question uh, because um, it's very difficult to ascertain a time when you can license. You never know when you are ready. Um, so, of course, uh, if we do the due diligence that we uh, have to do, like to understand uh, what the intellectual property is and trying to define it, what is that that I have done that is uh, different? Uh, at times for academics, I have seen they are very modest. They do have inventions, but they think, oh, that, that's already there in the public domain. What I have done is very, uh, very incremental, very small. There's hardly anything uh, that I have done. But uh, that can be actually uh, your invention. Uh, might be that small incremental uh, change that you have done can save somebody money or save some power or uh, increase somebody's eff uh, efficiency of working. So it's very important that you explore with your colleague or if there is an IPR uh, personnel uh, in the university or anyone you are working with separately to try to define it. I'm sure there would be some friends of the university where you can um, just call up that person and try to explore like uh, not everything is very clear at times, which is because again for patenting, there are uh, in Indian patent, I think it's the section 3D, which tells you what you cannot patent. There are, of course, in each of those, uh, in, uh, in each of the countries we have 
provisions which what cannot be patented but if 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 it cannot be patented there are other ways that you can protect it so it's very important in the very initial stage when you think that what you are working on is very important it can have importance in the market and somebody would be interested so to define your ip think about the ip strategy like um, what you can do with it if, whether it's copyright whether you want to take uh, keep it a bit of uh, secret uh, you want to have a know how so each of those aspects are very important then to um, understand like who can be your ideal partner to take it to the market uh, from the university to uh, to complete the whole process is difficult or challenging i'll say it's not difficult or not done uh, it's challenging you need the right person in the place so you need to find the partners or the stakeholders or your champion who would be uh, helping you to uh, go to the next stage and also uh, i always say like um, as academics you all are uh, you want to share your knowledge you want to talk about the work you are doing it's good but at times you need to be very cautious whom you are talking uh, to so a non disclosure agreement of some form if it's uh, if it's a legal entity it's very good to protect your rights or to have things in place and um, also to add value uh, to be very uh, it depends at what stage uh, your invention uh, is to add value so the, there is this example uh, of apple mobile so uh, the apple mobile a uh, basic part of the assembly happens uh, in china so at that time the uh, the valuation is not that much then uh, of course a lot of those uh, operating system software modules are added to it it's okay the um, uh, the valuation is not still that much the major part of the valuation of the apple mobile comes from the design or that uh, brand value or that uh, that uh, what the aesthetic value that uh, people associates with uh, apple that okay it will have a it's a premium product or it's a very high end product and it will give me that speed that i want to uh, have in my mobiles so it it uh, it depends uh, what the value comes from uh, also i have put here uh, um, in the uh, case of the pharmaceutical sector uh, so when the 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 percentage of revenue actually you are getting by licensing a technology at a certain stage also determines at what stage uh, uh, gives you most value so for the discovery stage the percentage of the revenue that you get is like uh, 3% when it's a lead molecule it is 4 to 5% so it's increasing so if you go to the clinical stages then it's 6 to 7% so if it increased a bit a bit more so and uh, don't be uh, eluded by the fact that it's only 3% because this might turn to be a blockbuster and 3% of like uh, how much is uh, that would be a big figure i don't want to go to the uh, calculations so uh, so determining that when you can license is a, again a, a collective discussion and decision and uh, you need to feel um, comfortable and confident that um, you have the ip sorted out uh it doesn't need to be a patent i just keep on stressing that uh, it doesn't have to be patent always but at the same time don't outrightly publish your uh, uh papers give a thought that if there can be a way to uh, protect it then it would be it would add value in the sense because industry is always uh, what i have talking to investors and uh, industry have understood that they value patent in the sense because they they also get that when they license a patent they also give gets that monopoly or the exclusiveness uh, or uh, that they can uh, pass on to the others like they can stop somebody else from uh, taking uh, something that they have now uh, got a license to so um, for that it's very important just um, have a thought about uh, it like and understand when the uh, when the license can up so summing it up um, definition uh, so we defined what a license is it's a contract of some form and it's a permission that a, a person who holds the ip gives to a person who wants to take the ip on some terms that are uh, that are uh, laid out in the agreements 
then uh, what is um, what to license now we know that it's all the intellectual property rights that four or five what we have and also other small things like uh, the business models the uh, the uh, the regulatory files or the the unsuccessful stories uh, as we can call or uh, some type of questionnaires so the in, the list can be endless and uh, why to license of course there is the there is a business aspect to it that is the uh, reaching the market quickly and uh, when to license also it's when you think uh, the invention is ripe and you have the value that you want to get out of it that is you are considering licensing the technology so let's take a small break and um, this is Sorry, going to the movie. I think none of us had gone to the movie. Everything is under lockdown in UK, and uh, and also I don't think so any of you have been able to do. But uh, how about um, we uh, create a very hypothetical uh, scenario where we are at our desk trying to explore opportunity to go to a movie, and we um, uh, book a ticket and go to the movie with our family. So all along the way, from the time that you are looking at the website to book a ticket to the stage where you go to um, the movie theater, uh, how many forms of IP do you see or you encounter? So I would be, uh, it would be really nice if you can uh, again um, come up to the chat window and uh, let me know what do you think about the different forms of IP licenses that you encounter. Uh, from the moment that you want to book a ticket to go to the movie and you take your family to the movie theater. You can use your imagination. How about again I start? Uh, copyright in what? Book my show up. Wow, good. Yes. So, so in this app, you of course have some form of uh, IP. There is an algorithm that is behind it. They might have a um, protection over there uh, or um, yes. So there is some form of license that has happened. Either you have signed into the app uh, and uh, taken the permission to use the app. So yes, that's good. Then you have missed something big, like you are doing it on the laptop might be. So the laptop is a like amalgamation of all the IP rights you can have a patent. Uh, I am on a Dell laptop, so I have a brand uh, uh, IP licensing. OTT, OK, uh, OK, then you are not leaving home. <laughs> you are doing it from Netflix. OK, so I wanted you to go out and see some movie. Windows, yeah, that's what exactly I told, yes. Yeah, Prime is a trademark. Yeah, that's um, you're recognizing the trademark license. Yeah, you're looking at it right. How about uh, since I uh, I had extended to go to the movie theater, how about using your car and the car uh, is uh, full of uh, uh, full of uh, those type of licenses and now with those 4G and 2G and 5G technologies, I don't know how many uh, patent license are you sitting on when you are driving your uh, car out and uh, they have the brand name. They have uh, design the designs of the see, tires. Well done. Yes, I had a case about the good uh, good eye tires. I think oh, I forgot. I thought I'll mention that 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 was quite interesting again. Yes, tires. Good on the way. What, what are you seeing? Yes, good ear tires, right? They had a very uh, interesting case. Uh, of course, um, uh, Charles Goodyear, uh, he invented rubber, uh, that technology uh, which could uh, be used for making things out of rubber. Uh, and uh, he uh, licensed it to a different sectors and uh, it was used in dentistry also at a time. I've forgotten what the particular application was, uh, but uh, of course um, the Goodyear tire that we see is uh, different from uh, Charles Goodyear who invented the rubber, uh, that, that uh, vulcanization of rubber or what that process of making it. Um, so they are not related, but there was a trademark infringement case that interested me. 
Yes, so we have we are in the car. We have explained uh, all the licenses related to the car. Then when you are, when we are on the way, we see all the shops with their holdings and all. So there is somewhere a trademark for making oh for making impression and interest. Wow, thank you, uh, Dipang Shurana. Yes, sorry, I forgot that production logo. For example, Dharma production. Okay, yes, that's good. That's good. Those are uh, yes, title to the music. Yeah. When you go to the movie theater, you have that particular the PVRs and all have a particular format, how or the that way of uh, operating the business. So you have that type of trademark licensing over there. Okay, and when you are going to uh, see the movie, uh, there is again um, the copyright uh, license that is inbuilt into it. So that will come uh, remind us of the fallout in the three idiots case i think where the um, the director producers had a fallout with the author for on whose book it was supposed to be uh, op, uh, adopted so there there might have been copyright license that was popcorn vending shops and said yes yes that can be good even why not about thinking of the somebody uh, patent in the po uh, popcorn process or the vending machine we don't know i'm sure if you look into uh, in the patent searching we will find somebody have uh, have a vending machine on that. Uh, that reminds me uh, when I was giving the example of the tea. So I found some patents uh, where uh, or designed rather where somebody has uh, uh, combined the uh, teapot and the kettle together to form a uh, tea brewing machine which brews the tea at a particular temperature. Uh, dress codes of yes, that's somewhere the brand that they are coming up. So yes, so they have some form of brand protection in there. So that's what we see in the merchandise, like when uh, the that uh, Kolkata Knight Riders or Daredevil, uh, Delhi Daredevils play. They have all the T-shirts and logos where there is some form of uh, apparels. Does the layout of the movie theater and color mix uh, used to have license? I'm not very sure about that, but I'm. Uh, it can be uh, because I was noting on the seats design. Uh, recently, I came across a case where uh, these people were designing the uh, seat layout in aircrafts. So I'm sure uh, there can be. Does the layout of the movie theater and color mix? OK, this is what I talked about. Different flavored popcorns, of course. Uh, yes, somebody can try uh, that. Um, OK, that's good. I think we have uh, been enough into the movies now and uh, explored all the licensing that can be there. So we will move to the next section where I have uh, I thought that I'll take you through some of the case studies where uh, it's not in details. And of course, uh, <laughs> I, I have my tea actually. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but it's it's past uh, lunchtime, right? I don't know. I mean, it's 1130. It's nearing my lunchtime rather. So yeah, thanks for participating and sorry for making you to feel hungry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so um, I'll talk a bit on the COVID vaccine. So th this is of course uh, quite research from the internet. So I do not know the depth of the stories or depth of what actually happened. So uh, for the COVID vaccine in the, uh, as we all know, the Oxford University was working on this since uh, the break of the uh, pandemic. And in early, uh, I'm sure uh, um, they have some patents uh, related to this technology, not particularly might be to uh, detect the COVID. And uh, they had developed to the stage and uh, and then AstraZeneca comes into the picture and uh, the university has licensed their know-how and the patent to AstraZeneca uh, to help them to evaluate to manufacture and of course to uh, distribute it. So for the university, it's not uh, easier uh, or it's it's challenging to do all this uh, work because they are not apt for it. Of course, they are doing the uh, clinical trials uh, and they are doing the wor uh, work on the development phase, but to uh, evaluate it with the patients, uh, they, it's better to uh, work with a uh, commercial partner who are well into the uh, domain. 
and that's what they uh, did and uh, it moved from uh, the university to the um, to astro through a license which uh, i do not know the details of the license uh, i did see there was uh, some freedom on the freedom to op uh, freedom to information um, on the basis of that, somebody had sorted, but uh, of course, uh, Oxford did not divulge everything because uh, those are of commercial interest. And uh, the license from uh, Oxford to AstraZeneca helped them to produce it, uh, manufacture it. And again, AstraZeneca has uh, provided license to Serum Institute to uh, increase the production. So here is a case where uh, they uh, might be patent and know how licenses have uh, been into place and uh, it has helped the uh, the work of the academics to move from uh, from the academia to the to the industry so um, then uh, for the case of uh, the 5g technology i know i mean covid and 5g is quite uh, hot topics and uh, as uh, when I looked into it, there were some 35,000 patents that are uh, that have been filed uh, between 2000, I think eight or 2007. The standardization of the patents happened within, uh, or the um, what is it? Technology happened around 2017, and there is a huge uh, rise in the patent filing during that time. And uh, of course, um, Huawei, uh, Qualcomm and uh, to name Samsung, they are a few of those who are leading the way for the 5G technology. And as we know the concept uh, like of uh, of using the patents, if uh, I, I use a technology uh, and it is infringing somebody's IP, then I am an infringer and they can sue me. In the 5G or all those telecommunication sector, uh, it has become so overlapping and the, uh, and the inventions are so incremental that uh, one cannot operate the technology without uh, infringing the others. So long back when this, uh, the 2G and 3G were uh, being developed, they have uh, developed this uh, uh, patent pool where all the patents are pulled together and uh, and they're standardized uh, um, and uh, and whoever is operating in this uh, scenario they can take a license like the manufacturers or the integrators can take a license from that patent pool as it is called standard essential patents license and uh, these are available for uh, you might I, i'm not sure frand uh, which is a fair reasonable and non discriminatory license rates there's a huge lot of uh, commotion and confusion in this area uh, and uh, but it of course shows the importance of intellectual property and uh, how it is uh, valuable for commercialization because uh, and also how people are coming together to have this type of standards in place uh, so that uh, everyone can operate and use the technology and um, till now till i think 4g or 3g i'm of course, I'm not that, um, I don't know so well on the sectors. Uh, uh, but uh, if you look back in 2G or 3D, people, uh, the companies were cross licensing their uh, technology patents. So, uh, and it was okay. But now moving into 5G, where not only the integrators are uh, software integrators or the telecom integrators, the automobile sectors are coming into the picture also. And uh, that sector is very different. So, there's a lot of uh, differences, commotion, uh, but um, the what do you say? The lesson for us is that licensing is important. The 5G is also quite um, important in the licensing scenario. This is the telecommunication sector. The third one that you can see is about uh, commercialization of sensor. This is something I was leading on. So we have a group of academics who are very, uh, very well known for their work in uh, fiber optic uh, sensors, uh, which optical sensors. And um, these are uh, humidity and temperature sensors. Humidity and temperature sensors are very well known. Uh, like they are, uh, they're well known electronic sensors, which are quite cheap. Uh, but uh, the application wise uh, few areas they are not very useful especially uh, i have uh, shown you the uh, bridge which collapsed because um, there was a tunnel uh, underneath and that was eroded and 
that uh, couldn't be uh, detected. So as a part of the highway maintenance, at times uh, this type of sensors are used and the humidity sensors utilization is in uh, where um, to say uh, they detect uh, humidity in very adverse condition. Our uh, humidity sensor works in sewers and waste uh, treatment plants, biosense, uh, biodegradable, biodigester, sorry. And uh, they can detect uh, uh, the humidity in that, that type of uh, acidic condition where because of the acidity in the environment, the sensors were eroded. Um, and um, the, uh, of course, uh, the researchers were working on this technology for like 10 years. A lot of the technology was um, published, uh, a lot. Uh, when I looked into it, uh, I could hardly uh, see something that I could patent it. Uh, and um, but anyway, we started the commercialization process. We uh, sat with the uh, academic, understood what the technology was, what was that specialty, or how, how we say as unique selling point of this technology. And we had a one pager out uh, made out of it. And uh, then uh, we reached out to various industries and uh, understood what the market is. Uh, we quickly understood the market was not uh, very much UK because UK does not get that type of extreme heat uh, in order to have those type of uh, like uh, the acidic reaction or uh, whatever. It, it's more in a humid condition that uh, it would be very helpful on. Uh, there, uh, in Canada, we could see a market, but of course it was quite concentrated. Then uh, we reached out to people on LinkedIn. That's what, I mean, you have to be quite... Um, uh, I think one thing leads to another and you uh, we understand from uh, each other quite a lot and um, and then uh, after that uh, we found somebody in Europe uh, and um, he was interested to understand what the technology was and we had a evaluation license with them for um, uh, for three months where they, uh, we sent the census and they uh, uh, evaluated it for three uh, three months and once they were very uh, satisfied with the results uh, they were happy to license it in this case it was a know-how license there was no patents over there but uh, we complemented each other the academics were very good in designing the census but uh, we did not have have the have the capability to manufacture it uh, that manufacturing happened uh, and the company was good in manufacturing and uh, uh, distributing it so there was a perfect marriage and uh, the negotiation started so uh, this is this is how uh, i wanted to take a case of uh, different sectors and different type of uh, licenses that can happen um, licensing of the copyright, um, again, Harry Potter, uh, yeah, of course, uh, I have a daughter who is seven years old and she's uh, quite like uh, a very big fan of Harry Potter. So uh, when J.K. Rowling wrote the storybooks, I have, uh, no, none of the publisher wanted to publish it because they didn't think that it was it would be so good as a um, uh, book. So not only it was uh, famous for uh, all the 7-8 series, which is there uh, that became quite famous or uh, renowned among not only kids, it's even with adults. And, um, yeah, and uh, this was again developed into movies. So there was, of course, some form of uh, copyright license to adapt it in the movies. And uh, also we find a lot of apparels uh, which are with Harry Potter uh, themes. So that's uh, that's again the licensing of copyrights i have talked a bit about the three idiot movie i don't want to go into that uh, licensing of trademark um, uh, take for the case of the mcdonald's you see in each new and corners nowadays a mcdonald uh, um, uh, shop so what distinguishes them uh, is of course the brand and the like uh, the um, slogan they have that's quite important at the same time the way uh, they uh, they they have um, or the business model they apply or the way the store is uh, actually uh, arranged or what technology they use in the store all those things are a part of the uh, licensing of trademarks uh, I wanted to touch upon this case, interesting case rather. So 
we uh, i think uh, we all like masa so coca cola is the one who is uh, who um, sells uh, masa these days uh, not only these days it's since 1980s i think yeah so yeah, so um, in 1976 i think the uh, masa brand was uh, incorporated somewhere and it was sold mostly in middle east and african countries and uh, in 1980 in 1993 uh, bisleri uh, who had the right uh, to maza that time sorry uh, they uh, sold or uh, assigned their rights to the brand to coca cola now um, uh, time fast forward in 2008 or 9 uh, bisleri tried to um, Okay, sorry. Coca-Cola tried to, uh, uh, or Bisleri tried to um, register a trademark in Turkey for Maza, and of course, Coca-Cola uh, raised a concern about it because the trademark was already sold to it, uh, along with the uh, know-how and all that things. Sorry, may I ask what's not working? Uh, I see uh, a lot in the chat about it's not working. Oh, ma'am, it's uh, the presentations are working. It's a feedback. It's active now. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, I was not looking at it suddenly. I thought it's not working. Okay. So now, um, short story is like uh, Coca-Cola uh, has the rights to the brand, and uh, since uh, it has uh, a trademark assignment for using it within India, it can stop. Uh, and or it did uh, bring in an injunction for Bisleri to produce and export the brand from India. So this is also a quite uh, interesting case for trademark uh, licensing, or uh, this is trademark assignment rather, sale of trademark. Um, yes, so uh, we come to the license agreement. Um, we have learned now about uh, what licensing is why is it important now the important is uh, like once we have the thought of licensing uh, a license agreement is something that will come into place but before a license agreement uh, it's always advisable to have a term sheet what we call term sheet term sheet is nothing but uh, a non-binding agreement or non-binding or as you call uh, i think most of you would be knowing about um, memorandum of understanding so it's an understanding between two parties to understand how they each think about each of the clauses like intellectual property what each of their vision is about intellectual property what each of them want to do with the uh, technology it's uh, it's quite different what the ip owner thinks and what the ip the one to uh, take the license thinks like the licensor and the licensee so those uh, things needs to be uh, quite well uh, understood and there should be a clarity on that uh, to grind it down to the very details as we call the devil is in the details and then uh, to have understanding about which are the areas that the licensee wants to uh, actually take this product to it's not uh, good to give them uh, uh, something what they do not want or they do not have value in so uh, before a license agreement is negotiated uh, uh, usually um, there is a discussion about uh, uh, between the parties and there is a sharing of documents there is a due diligence and in those documents there is like what it part, what each party wants to do sorry and uh, this then uh, finally leads to the license agreement uh, but even when you talk to somebody about the license agreement and want to discuss about the technology, I cannot stress more on uh, using the non-disclosure agreement. Uh, this is a deterrent factor. If they anyway go and choose to um, break the confidence, legal action and all are there. But at least people know that if they are signing the um, non-disclosure agreement, they're supposed to keep the confidentiality of, a, uh, of the discussion that they are happening. So a license agreement is a, a contract uh, or um, that happens uh, between a licensor who is the IP owner and the licensee who wants to take up the license. And it has a few uh, terms and conditions as we tell it. 
and uh, this terms and condition determines what the licensee is allowed to do and uh, what the licensee's obligations are, what are the licenses obligations. Uh, and uh, it's a mutual relationship. Uh, it's a start of relationship rather. And uh, this document is very crucial. And uh, before it is signed, a lot of discussion happens and the negotiation stage is very lengthy at times and very draining. But ultimately, the uh, the silver lining is that the technology is adopted by a licensee and it uh, it, it can be uh, developed further. Um, so negotiation is important, but uh, as I always say, I'm, I'll cover that in the um, other sections. Uh, it's not the end, uh, so it's better that um, there is win-win situation for both. Uh, most of the universities um, technologies are very early stage, so there is a lot of um, nervousness among the investors or the licensee to take up a uh, technology which uh, which doesn't have a proof. Uh, but at the same time, if they are visionaries, they know that what the university does today, the industry will do 10 years after. So we are quite 10 years ahead at times. So it just needs the uh, early adopters and the believers to take it forward. Um, the license agreement has some key headings. Uh, uh, of course, uh, first is that um, the parties, who are the parties to the agreement? Like any other agreement, uh, if you have seen any contract, it says about uh, who are the parties, where are their offices registered? And then comes a, a recital section where uh, where it depends from lawyer to lawyer. Of course, uh, as I should suggest that uh, license agreement do take the help of any lawyer. Uh, we also don't do it to, uh, on our own at times. Uh, so it, we do uh, pass it through a legal uh, to have a legal eye on it. So um, recitals, it depends, as I was telling from lawyer to lawyer, how they want to define or recite what the agreement is about. I've seen some people going very uh, broad and a bit and some having one liners that uh, um, the licensor has this technology and they are happy to license it to the licensee and the licensee is happy to take a uh, license. So it's uh, it can be as simple as that or somebody can uh, give a bit of background like how it developed. So it uh, absolutely OK on that. Then definition is very important and uh, to define each and everything like when is the commencement date of the uh, license. So it might be very clear to everybody that when the license is signed, that is the day on the when the commencement can happen. Uh, when the license start, but you can have a different license date. At times what I have done for startups, I have given a holiday period uh, for initiating the license. So to, uh, to think that the license is safe, of course the startups go through a very much of uh, um, uh, what is a uh, very volatile period, as you can say in a very simple words. Uh, so um, I have uh, provided them uh, this type of uh, conditions that once they have a commercial manager in place or once they have a um, paying customer in place, then only the license takes in. So those, those type of um, taking in dates and all can be uh, built in into the definition section. Then to define what the intellectual property is, then um, what are the uh, when we call talk about royalty what is royalty how to define royalty if we are basing the royalty on net sell what is net sell defined as what is profit and there is a uh, like uh, if you have seen the patents how we define the patents similar somewhere similar we can but patents are like we are our own lexicographer in uh, license agreements not like that it should have uh, what is uh, what is common in the uh, contract law then grant of license is one of the most important clauses that uh, is there in the agreement, which talks about what a licensee is allowed to do, what he is not allowed to do. And I'll uh, discuss in the next slide about a bit uh, about the grant of license. Then the payment modules are important in a license agreement. Like, uh, of course, we are uh, all the license, most of the license, I will say, most of the licenses happens uh, for some type of economic benefit sharing. So that clauses uh, that needs to be clearly read out, like uh, what is uh, the payment module, how we are thinking of getting it and uh, how timely it should be, how not timely it should be, something like that. 
the basic of the ip is uh, intellectual property needs to be defined like uh, what is intellectual property it's not a license always have only one form of intellectual property it can be like different um, patterns trademark or know how it can be clubbed together and in that cases uh, the trademark uh, license have some definite uh, clauses like the con quality control trade for trademark that's very important because that uh, connects the uh, brand to the original original originator so that quality control is very important and that needs to be built in the agreement for copyright again uh, you need to have a understanding of what you are allowing the party to do whether you want him them to publish or if you want them to translate or stop the translation uh, you not giving them the translation right or if you ha want them to just uh, publish it with a form form attribution to you all those needs to be there then uh, liability is important if something uh, most of the universities uh, uh, technology are very early stage so it's very important that we build in this liability clause uh, and putting a liability uh, cap on it like how much we are liable for if in case there is a problem and of course liability should be uh, less Sorry, my tea is getting cold. Termination um, again is about um, when the license can get terminated. If it is attached to a patent, of course, it is uh, connected to the uh, patent term, which is like 20 years. If it is copyright, then as according to that, 70 years after the uh, death of the um, uh, author. Uh, or uh, we can uh, tie up like for the next uh, seven or ten years the license is there and after that the licensee has to come back and agree with us uh, or in case there is a um, transfer of there is uh, or, or there is some development what needs to be done so uh, these are the basic uh, clauses of the license agreement and uh, um, it's it's again uh, uh, as I told a lot of it is uh, the skeleton is in when we do that uh, term sheet or the memorandum of understanding and I really encourage to first discuss with the part uh, partner and on the term sheet so that it uh, clarifies uh, what they want and what the licensee wants and often we think what we want the licensee also want the same thing it's not true they have their own uh, motivation and uh, business decision to cover the license so it's always good to uh, have that uh, clear understanding and discussion and um, yeah then once those things are there then you can uh, take the help of a, a lawyer to put more flesh to the bones and uh, a 24 page license agreement is produced uh, which is really at times uh, quite problematic to go through uh, the grant of license uh, there are um, it is the as i told is its most important part where you define what you are giving uh, what uh, you are uh, giving the license a permission for whether it is exclusivity exclusivity means that uh, they are the only ones who can actually uh, use this license nobody else even not the licensor is allowed to use it or the sole uh, license which is like the uh, the licensor and the licensee can use it together uh, or the non-exclusivity or non-exclusivity means a lot of people can uh, use this uh, technology uh, so uh, these are the different levels of exclusivity and uh, you can have um, talking about the um, exclusivity um, though you are giving the um, licensee the exclusivity uh, to use your uh, technology the academics always retains the right to publish uh, the um, or continue research and teaching in that area so there is always a clause that we try to put in the uh, license agreement which says that the academic can actually continue to uh, use this technology for the research and teaching because that's the purpose of the government funding for the research so that's always built into the agreement for the field is uh, like uh, for which uh, technology uh, will this license be uh, used for uh, uh, when I took the example of the battery uh, technology uh, it can be battery monitoring uh, or ba battery rechargeability something so uh, if it's only used for the car it this battery technology can be used for various sectors I see so if it's only being used for the car so we have to define it 
the field to be only in the cars. So we restrict the field. And uh, if the licensor wants uh, another uh, or additional field, so they can discuss it or they can come back later. So uh, once you have the license agreement signed and uh, signed, it's not like done and dusted. It can be amended uh, because, as I always say, it's a uh, it's a start of a relationship. It's the uh, it's not only that once you do the license, you for forget the licensee. It's a development of the stages. Then territory is again where the licensee wants to sell the product or when they where they want to operate, uh, whether uh, it is only uh, locally or they want to go abroad if they want it to be somewhere else. Sorry, so they want to see what uh, they are doing. And uh, you have to uh, define in the agreement accordingly. Uh, sub licensing, it's again uh, depends uh, what the license uh, licensees business model is, whether they need to uh, license uh, the technology to somebody else. For example, for software uh, licenses, uh, the licensee may not be the one that is uh, uh, selling it uh, directly or having this um, um, exclusive sales. They might license it to further companies who, who are the integrators or who are the uh, who are uh, developing the technology further. So what activities are allowed? Like I took the example of the copyright, uh, whether they are only allowed to publish it, copy it, uh, or they are allowed to translate it also. Those type of uh, nitty gritty needs to be explained properly. Specific exclusions like what they're not allowed to do might be the, you don't want them to uh, manufacture it in, in the territory that you are there. So you might exclude ex, uh, the particular te territory or you might uh, exclude the area that you think you would be able to uh, work. For example, a software company having um, say, for example, Facebook, this is very hypothetical. Uh, it's a social media company working uh, on the data of the pr people working okay uh, ai and all are important but they might have uh, developed uh, another hardware device that they think is uh, that they thought would be used for their um, uh, business but it's not of any use they might uh, uh, they might uh, license it to somebody else and might exclude that person to use it for data analysis or something like that so it's a very vague uh, example but that type of exclusion can be a part of it so now coming to the royalties, um, um, of course, the whole scenario about um, uh, about the licensing is about uh, getting some benefit out of it. So there can be licenses which are open licenses or uh, um, there are universities who give out uh, open license or uh, free uh, licenses. Uh, to promote some technologies or uh, for increasing the traffic in the website and to for companies to come might be one thing is free but the other thing is not free might be uh, say for uh, for a particular we have a technology in um, wave designing uh, or uh, what impact waves have on the, uh, on structure in the sea so there is a model uh, on that and uh, the 2d uh, modeling is open source or open for uh, people to use. But the 3D, once they want the 3D, that needs to be uh, have a license. So those type of models can be adopted. So when we come for the economic benefit, royalty is a word that we use. So from Wikipedia, we, I found that a royalty is a payment made by one party to another that owns the particular asset uh, for the rights to ongoing use of that asset. So uh, royalty is a form of payment that uh, the licensee pays to the licensor for using the technology. And uh, to determine the royalties, um, that's another big task. Uh, so, and the royalties can be in different forms. Like uh, then, uh, as I have seen, it can be in the form of like uh, you can ask for. You can be very creative about what you want from the licensee uh, on the form of royalties. It can be long term that you want the royalties to come, or some type of collaborations, or some type of share in the business. So it, but it, it's some form of economic um, benefits that you get out of the company. 
for determining the values, so often we are asked the question of IP valuations, so, uh, and it's a very difficult question. Uh, though if I go to the investors, the first thing that I have been asked for lots of startups, like uh, what is the valuation of the company? And um, to be very frank, I don't know. Uh, most of the times we don't know what is the IP valuation and especially for early stage technology where these are very early, very new technologies in the market uh, to value a product is um, difficult. Uh, when I started in this uh, role, uh, I used to be quite not confident about when the valuation question is to come, but uh, having talked to many of the, uh, what to say, uh, pioneers in the business or very uh, experienced people, I've seen that the valuation of a uh, technology or a product or a IP is uh, is uh, quite, um, uh, how do I put it? It's, I won't say it vague. There are, uh, of course, there are uh, valuation methods, and when it is uh, in some litigation or in uh, acquisition mergers, these valuations are really considered uh, to the depth. But when uh, licensing from a university, uh, the valuation is like a approach that we have to take. I'll, I'll take a very basic example, like when you go to the um, say for a for in a vegetable mandi, say uh, you have a execute uh, a very exotic looking fruit uh, and uh, you don't know how uh, what value it is. Like uh, you ask a shopkeeper, he says a value anything. Oh, it's too high. Then you try to bargain it and he says, no, no, it's too low. Then a time comes either you uh, come to a middle uh, uh, middle number, which is uh, beneficial for the shopkeeper and for you or you walk away and uh, while you walk away might be till the evening it is not sold and that is uh, spoiled so it's it's a similar scenario in the IP valuation I see uh, so to hang on the value uh, it's uh, it's not always the right thing so uh, and uh, to come to the valuation I'll come to the uh, techniques rather there are very uh, just to tell, uh, there are other ways also, uh, and uh, I cannot stress those more, but a uh, very basic approach is uh, the three uh, approaches, that is the cost approach, the market approach, uh, and the income approach. So um, in the, in the uh, cost approach, uh, what we do is um, we try to... Uh, Calculate the cost that has uh, been involved in developing a product. So, um, say uh, this project has been going on for five years. You have got uh, X amount of uh, amount from A funding, X amount of amount from B funding, and uh, you calculate or add up those things. And you have uh, invested uh, some amount for IP protection. Uh, you have invested this much of amount in um, the academic time. And you put all this together and uh, come to a value. And that can be a cost approach. It's not always yes, right. It's it's not al always uh, the right approach, but uh, it does give uh, some form of some yeah, form of. Uh, uh, some some form of uh, sorry uh, somebody's mic is on if you can just uh cpc is there one requesting uh oh, ma'am one second abhijit sir please so yeah ma'am you can continue yeah so uh on the basis of that, uh, we can uh, come to um, some form of uh, some form of some amount that we think that uh, would be uh, efficient and uh, and that can give a projection of how much uh, value that uh, IP can be of or the technology can be valued at, and how much royalty you can expect to cover that uh, technology. Then the market approach is like uh, to see that uh, what type of other technology are in the market and how much they are charging for that technology. And on the basis of that, you can do a comparison. But in most of the early stage, they do a valuation of the patent. So that can be somewhere uh, helpful that you can uh, show people that, OK, this is the value of uh, the, the IP that is there. 
then uh, income approach uh, is uh, uh, where you this is a futurative uh, projection where you think that uh, uh, what will this uh, cost in 10 years time and what is the value that this uh, this technology will add to this company and what they can bring to the market uh, again going back to the analogy of the uh, battery uh, technology and the automobile sector so since the automobile sec auto these automobile companies uh, moving towards the electric car and the battery uh, can be uh, really helpful uh, so that is adding value to their business and might be they would be uh, able to charge a, um, a extra amount or uh, or there would be some level of or they have saved some time in the R&D uh, and that can be a way of uh, um, projecting what the value of the IP is. So uh, these are the very basic methods which you can uh, have a go at and uh, determine what the valuation of the technology can be and accordingly uh, put a value to the technology and uh, but ultimately it's again a discussion open to discussion among the licensor and licensee and how much each uh, person thinks the whole technology is worth and uh, how it is to be uh, remunerated so uh, once we have determined the value it's a time when to understand how to share the value and that's where the uh, that's what the whole concept of the royalty is like giving back a percentage of the uh, benefit that uh, the intellectual property has uh, generated in the licenses business so as a rule of thumb as uh, we uh, are told it's a 25 percent of the profit so uh, the concept behind is that uh, of course the technology has been developed by the institute or the innovator uh, inventor but it takes a lot of uh, investment energy time money to bring that into the product so uh, as i was telling like uh, uh, we had a te technology in 2009 for which we had filed a patent and uh, it took us 10 years to find a proper licensee to take it to the market and also the licensee, of course, the market was very ripe when the licensee took it up. And it's now that the licensee is using the technology to uh, put it into the uh, uh, into the product and sell it. So it's a very long process. Uh, the development process is there long. And at the same time, the, um, the commercialization process is also to be taken into account. So as a uh, rule of thumb, uh, it says that uh, you can claim 25% of the profit uh, that the licensee makes out of the business as a um, royalty. But that's again, is always not true. Uh, so you look at those uh, different uh, valuation methodology, the profit uh, margin, and also there are some standards published for each industry. Might be I have covered it in the next slide which you can have a look and understand how much uh, it is. Uh, it again depends on um, that the sector. So manufacturing sector, the profit margins are not uh, very high. So the royalty rates are quite low at times. Software, on the other hand, you can claim a royalty as high as 20% because uh, they do not need that much of investment in the sense of uh, manufacturing or uh, hardware, that type of, uh, what is it, build it up uh, to building it. Of course, the investment is required for a business model or having the um, sales and all, but uh, not as high of uh, investment uh, as in the manufacturing sectors. Again, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the pharmaceutical uh, sector, uh, it is a long time, but when the revenues come in, it's quite high. Uh, so uh, again, uh, it, it is uh, quite a different model of uh, royalty collection that happens over there. So it depends uh, what the, but it's very difficult to come to the, uh, what is say, um, the right amount. So it's a mixture of calculating the value of your technology, calculating what others are getting in a similar situation, and also understanding what the licensing wants to pay. So if you do not like, if you do not have a licensee who is ready to go and sell it, there is no, um, there is percentage is like percentage of zero is zero. So uh, you don't get anything out of it. So it's 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 you have to see what it's best there. And um, 
Okay, royalties can be uh, okay. The um, royalties can be uh, on different types of uh, royalties that can you can uh, think of. It can be on the sales, uh, as I told, uh, a percentage of the sales. Or it can be uh, tired royalty, where uh, you can, uh, especially we see this in the pharmaceutical sector. I think one of the examples I showed, like every stage that the uh, drug moves uh, into, you have some royalty attached to it. And uh, the closer uh, the drug is towards the market, the more the royalty can be claimed. So it might be for uh, ha having the investigational uh, file ready and submitted and ticked on. That is a uh, amount of royalty that you can get. Once it clears the phases, you get a different royalty. And uh, that way it can be there. Uh, stacked royalties are similar situation where you can, uh, for different things, you can stack it up. Uh, and uh, also at times you have to uh, license some other technology in order to use one technology and that is where stacking of royalties happens. Reach through royalties, uh, especially this is uh, very prevalent in the, um, the pharmaceutical sectors again, where uh, say for a drug analysis, you need a mouse model and uh, that mouse model uh, has been licensed so might be you would be testing the drug but still have to uh, provide a license uh, fee to the mouse model holder since it is important for testing your drug and uh, though it's not that we related to the development of the drug but there is some reach through royalties that has uh, and uh, that is claimed and on the success of the drug this uh, mouse model manufacturer or license holder will be getting some fee there can be lump sum money, uh, lump sum fees at times might be uh, the licensor is like, I need the money in one go and I'm not uh, uh, concerned about how you are doing the business later on. So pay me this amount of money and you have the license for using it for the whole uh, perpetuity or to the whole of the la your life or uh, something like that. That type of license uh, fees is also possible. Signing fee is uh, like uh, you uh, pay a small amount of fee for signing uh, the license and then there is the tired uh, royalty that is coming from the sales or uh, for uh, crossing in each sector. Payment uh, by installment, it is also based on some milestone or you can tell the milestone payments. Uh, like if you reach 10,000 users, you pay some amount, then uh, 100, then you pay some amount. So it's again a uh, amount of uh, uh, about a, a point of discussion, uh, um, how the industry works. Uh, it's amalgamation of all those uh, information and what you want to do. And um, there can be fixed royalties. So every year you have to pay uh, um, like 15,000 for the license uh, as a license fee. These are also called minimum uh, uh, minimum license fee. So uh, in my licenses, I try to build up that. I have a percentage on the sales, net sales, and also a minimal royalty so that um, at least there is a, a fixed royalty that comes in every year, even if uh, the, min, uh, the sale might not be that high or the percentage of uh, royalty is uh, percentage on the sale is not as much we are expecting. So that is also there. But to be very frank, that is quite contended in the industry. So because that hampers with the cash flow, I have been told. So that's uh, but anyway, as a licensee professional, I, we need to safeguard the interest of the university. Uh, increasing royalty, so increasing royalty is again, um, you can increase the amount of the fees paid according to the number oh. of. Uh, so um, decreasing royalty can be again, uh, like when you have more competition in the market coming up, uh, then you can uh, slowly decrease the amount of the license fee that the licensee is supposed to fee, uh, supposed to pay you. And uh, it can, uh, the royalties can be time limited uh, so that um, after a certain time, when you think that uh, the investment that you have made for the development of the technology has been covered, you can give that uh, uh, stop the royalty. So it can be just the license becomes free after a certain time. Again, cap royalty has the same concept of uh, being uh, stopping after a certain time. Uh, here I have uh, given some example of um, how the royalty rates are. Um, so if you see um, 
sorry, my um, slides are so small, I can't even see things. So um, it's a, um, as I told, the software and the internet industry has the highest royalties around, uh, it can be around uh, 14 to 20%. And uh, electricals and electronics have a very uh, small margin of profit, semiconductors too. So they have very uh, less uh, margin that you can uh, ask for, or the royalty rates are quite uh, low, like three to four percent. And uh, I think again, I mean, depending on the challenges and the profit in the market, uh, it's uh, how the royalty rates are calculated and what uh, the um, market wants to pay. So it's again uh, a point of discussion for everybody. So uh, having covered the most important sections of the exclu uh, the grant of the license and the royalties, the other clauses that is to be looked into are uh, uh, the diligence that is there in the mark. Like the licensee has some obligations to actually report to you about how they are using the license and uh, how much profits or how much they are gaining out of it. And uh, that needs to be built in into the agreement. Uh, improvement if you think that if the licensee improves upon your product uh, whether you want to have a uh, license back of that technology or the licensee needs to pay uh, more or you are uh, you give them any permission to uh, have some improvements warranties and uh, indemnities we covered like giving uh, that uh, since this is a um, technology i always uh, use this uh, term uh, about this is uh, early stage technology developed within the university so we cannot give you any warranties that it will produce uh, features uh, or it will uh, give you uh, the results that we are telling uh, this is accepted and contended both i have seen people uh, uh, licenses accepting it at times because they also uh, come across universities but uh, at the same time there are people who uh, contained it uh, like why cannot we give the warranties but being a charity and a university uh, it's difficult at times to uh, give that type of uh, warranties indemnities uh, in the sense that if there is an infringement and third party uh, resistors uh, resistors some form of um, uh, cases against you uh, then who is the one who to, whom to be uh, working on uh, and uh, who is the one to be indemnified if there is a uh, third party challenge and also uh, we need to be mindful of the antitrust uh, and the competition law we cannot monopolize the business or we are being uh, a big uh, company we cannot uh, uh, we cannot uh, force somebody to take a license or uh, undermine them. So those clauses are very important in the um, license agreement. And mo many a times the lawyers are the one to hint about it or educate it that, OK, this type of invention, I think this clause would be important. And as I have told about, uh, like for uh, technology license, there is a, a different sort of um, clauses that is more that needs emphasis on for trademark licenses, this is uh, the uh, importance of quality control becomes very important because that is one attributed to the trade name and that uh, saves the reputation. Uh, the trademark is all about that. And for copyright, again, uh, you need to understand like uh, what is allowed, uh, whether it can be translated and adopted into some form or it is not. Uh, so uh, again, these are the all the uh, specific aspects of the trademark. Uh, sorry, the ag license agreement, which is a contract. So summing up, uh, we had a bit of discussion about the different IP licensing scenarios and a bit on the case laws and uh, what is, what has been there, what not. Uh, structure of a license agreement, uh, which is again, um, uh, which defines. Uh, uh, in one of my slides, I just gave a, a front page, uh, app, uh, what do you say, um, extract of the license. If you go on the internet, I saw uh, very good license agreements on the ha Harvard uh, University's website. Um, if you want to have a look, go over there and have a look how the different forms of license. They, it's quite open, but I didn't want to uh, download and share it that way, but uh, you can have a look there. And uh, we discussed about the IP valuation, the minimum, uh, the basic forms of IP valuation and the 
royalties or the benefits that uh, a license agreement uh, or from licensing we can get and how different forms of royalties are in place and what we can do about it. Um, OK. Mm. OK, so uh, before we go to this stage, I had some questions, uh, but uh, I thought uh, um, I have uh, put that question for the uh, multiple choice questions that will come afterwards to you. Uh, but in the before we go to this strategy and license management stage, what, what how about we do another um, discussion where uh, I give you again a scenario and you come back to the chat window. And the scenario is that uh, you as an academic have a um, have developed a technology. You think this has uh, value in the uh, industry and you are you want to talk to an industry partner. Uh, what are the steps that you are going to do based on the discussion that we have been having till now? So. Yeah, if you can. Uh, type your answers. Is my uh, question clear? Like you are an academic, you have an invention. Uh, you think this can be a very good product. You are starting to talk to a company who are interested, who thinks, oh, yeah, yeah, this is very good. Let's uh, talk uh, and take this forwards. Uh, there can be a licensing in the um, in the picture uh, forward. So what are the things that you need to be aware of and what you are going to do? No, uh, applying for license doesn't come first. Uh, might be, uh, did you mean apply for a patent? Dr. Seema. So license is the uh, what do you say end of the whole thing might be or uh, starting a relationship uh, with the customer for first. What do you think you need to do? Yeah, I, uh, OK. Yeah, you if it's a technology, you need to discuss it with your uh, the head of the department. Uh, you cannot. Um, I do not know what IP policy you have in place. Okay, on that point, uh, you need to check your IP policy also. Each university has their IP policy, which determines uh, who the intellectual property belongs to in an academic scenario. So that is one of the thing that you need to check that who has the ownership of the intellectual property that you have uh, generated, and um, then. Uh, uh, then you need to OK. Uh, uh, I'm looking at the understand the need of the partner industry, due diligence, NDA sign negotiation. Wow, uh, Preeti, <laughs> Dr. Preeti, bang on. Yeah, very good. So yes, of course you need to do that. Just to add, I have not added. I was talking about the IP policy that is in place. So you need to also look at that and see what uh, ownership you have. Because if you do not have the ownership of the IP, you are not the one who needs to license it. You can be a part of the whole agreement, but the university is the one who is the licensor in that case. So you not need to clarify that. Uh, talk to your head of the department. Um, see uh, if uh, because patent filing needs some cost. Uh, patent filing uh, needs some cost also. So if who is going to bear that cost? Uh, that needs to be checked upon. Uh, talk to a IPR agent like uh, anyone who you know of, know of or whom the university works with. And um, of course, due diligence is very important. Uh, OK, I, uh, are you uh, OK? It's there in the slide. Uh, due diligence is important. Due diligence in the sense of uh, checking out the uh, particular person who is important, how, uh, who he is, uh, what industry he is, uh, just as, as a background check uh, and also uh, uh, seeing who others are there in the uh, whole scenario. So that's something NDA uh, is very good that India you need to have an NDA in place before you uh, start discussing anything. Uh, so you have uh, you and also I don't see the covering of the uh, IP. Uh, having an IP uh, management plan in place or IP portfolio or strategy in place like, OK, this is a technology that we can patent. So if we are not patenting now, we just want to wait and see what the industry wants and then might be within a uh, very short time we file a patent. And so long we are not filing a patent, we are not going to publish it and we are not uh, going to talk to anybody without an NDA. And we want to tr uh, talk to people only 
uh, giving them uh, or say not the secret sauce but just uh, enough to make them interested but not enough to for them to uh, do it themselves so that needs to be in place and um, okay uh, okay um, and then uh, what else do you think is would be good how about uh, when you are uh, negotiating the terms what should be the terms uh, about and what uh, how how do you define the ip what ip do you think uh, do you have what can you include in the ip okay i think uh, we have a, a good amount over there and uh, i think uh, a bit uh, the question was like uh, once the uh, this is uh, about the whole thing that i uh, covered here uh, like once you have the invention in uh, oh, good good yeah um, on the negotiation uh, i'll just go to the next few slides i'm uh, mindful of the time so the strategy and the license management so you have to uh, discuss about uh, among yourselves like what is the strategy uh, that you are going for the and what you want out of it as i discussed during the negotiation phase you need to have a term sheet in place due diligence uh, i think somebody mentioned um, you can have a evaluation agreement like the way i talked about the humidity sensor example and uh, of course do not talk to anybody without an nda in place uh, then uh, during the license management the performance obligation is very important then uh, milestones you can put like to put uh, some pressure on the licensee that okay after 2 uh, 3 years you need to get this type of value uh, the next 5 years this type of value we are looking for then minimum royalties like one i Uh, spoke about i usually put minimum royalties in the license agreement along with the percentage share uh again continuing on the license agreement it's good to have an audit of the licensee i am not sure how open they can be but uh, you can of course if you feel that they are not presenting the right va um, value there can be a way of uh, having audits in place uh performance uh, is of course like i said it you need to have a performance criteria built in the license agreement so that um any range of minimum royalty yeah i uh, if you see the slides uh, two three slides uh, i'll the, uh, i do have uh, put a slide where the minimum royalties are there so the pharmaceutical sector it depends um uh, it it can be uh, like um, it it can be from 5 to 15 you can think about that or uh, and uh, it depends how much the licensee wants to pay that that's the whole negotiation point so yeah since the whole um, ip licensing do's and don'ts were there i did think that i'll uh, put some uh, basic do's and don'ts so uh, i have been uh, i don't know if i have echoed enough this is not uh, uh, only one person's job it's a uh, it's a job of a whole unit to commercialize so that type of buying in needs to be there so you need a patent uh, attorney for the legal ip aspects of it you need a lawyer for the legality that is there in the uh, whole licensing process then the business and of course the academy because uh, the invention or the technology it's like their uh, baby um, then define and know your ip through and through uh, analyze the uh, um, whole situation carefully and do the projection right and uh, use uh, active licensing efforts uh, so um, uh, be very active in uh, showing that you want to license it um, then uh, clarity of licensing term is very important what is what is that you want don't keep anything vague because tomorrow that would be a problem use a term sheet nda where required use restriction to use the technology so these are all the do's and don't is that don't hang on the industrial standards on royalty like somebody asks me what is the range of the uh, range of minimum royalty okay it was not the royalty only so minimum royalty it de depends how much do you think uh, somebody will pay you minimum so there is no range in that so that's just to cover your cost what you may think about that 
uh, don't use forced licensing so don't force somebody to license rather it it's it's like a settlement that you should do and uh, royalty based on profit can be tricky so try to base it on net sales so profit uh, of course uh, people can manipulate the profit so uh, but the net sale is the amount that is printed on the uh, uh, sales so that is more reliable so that's all i have to share so uh, thank you for being so patient and uh, interactive uh, thanks thanks all thank you ma'am for a very interactive and informative session on different aspects of intellectual property rights and uh, the technology licensing and different uh, aspects of uh, ip life cycle now we do have few questions in the chat box uh, there is yeah. one question from mr sunil kumar savita he asks kindly enlighten about dispute settlement regarding copyright of any intellectual property i mean in which court such type of cases will be filed yeah this is a very good question uh, um, in the license agreement there is a section where you have the jurisdictions so uh, in case uh, you are of different countries uh, jurisdiction is mentioned over there so you have to uh, specify which jurisdiction whether it's the indian court that needs to it uh, has to be uh, litigated or it has to be uh, in uh, the european uk or in case you have multinational ones and it depends from country to country which court actually uh, ties your copyright uh, so uh, i do not have a specific answer for that so uh, whoever is assisting you in the legal because you need to hire a lawyer for that if you are contending that so they would be able to help you better but uh, the license agreement do have a section where you are supposed to um, tell which jurisdiction you want to uh, tie your case hope that helps uh, thank you ma'am there's one more question from dr preeti sangwe she asks any range of minimum loyalty royalty yeah that's what i answered uh, her so minimum uh, royalty can have a range uh, it can uh, um, it can be anything that uh, the licensee is happy to pay so that's again uh, a form of negotiation that you want to uh, go into but uh, it can be from 0 to 15 20 that's what we have seen so in my experience short experience that's what is happening minimum royalty is uh, the amount that you want every year to be paid so that again is on your assessment what a um, little amount that you want to uh, have as a assertion that uh, the licensee is committed towards commercialization so don't make it too high for the licensee to pay so you break the uh, whole uh, concept of licensing the the whole story about the licensing is you need from the uh, industry to take your invention and go and sell it so if they are not able to make profit because the whole business world is about profit so they won't be interested to take it so it it needs to be that balance so talk out with the licensee that's the best way i can suggest uh there's one more question from dr seema patewar she asks if the, if there are two authors for a book then will it get divided between the two authors yeah the invent uh, yeah authorship it uh, it depend uh, it would be like that so what happens uh, i'll tell about our university we have a invention disclosure form and uh, we uh, ask the uh, academic to fill that form which talks about what the invention is when the date of the invention happened and who are the ones who had contributed like who are the inventors so the form uh, captures who the inventors are if we get any royalty out of licensing that technology uh, that royalty gets gets divided among them and again it's uh, again relates back to the ip policy what we you have in the ip policy uh, how much uh, you are giving back to the author so it's it's all uh, in built in that thank you ma'am now i do not see any questions in the chat box so i have one question from my end uh, ma'am could you just uh, brief us on international uh, patent filing and uh, international licensing means uh, what are the basic differences between international patent filing or the do's and don'ts regarding the same okay so uh, when you say about international ip filing uh, patent filing in the sense that um, it's again uh, is a strategy that should be uh, governed by uh, what you want to do so if you uh, want your product to be commercialized uh, uh, globally then it's uh, 
it's a thing that you want to uh, take your uh, patents to different countries. So as I see it, uh, when I file a patent in UK, uh, I get a year time to determine how my invention is and who is my licensee and what where it can go. And accordingly, I take a decision with what I want to do with the international filing. So I, of course, go for the PCT filing because that gives me again 31 months from the 30 or 31 months from the time that I have uh, filed the first application. So you get like around three years time to determine which country you are going to uh, enter. So uh, this is all about the strategy that you want to do. So I would suggest that, of course, after you file the provisional in your uh, own country, uh, you file the complete in, uh, in the in your country and also the PCT. That buys you some time for uh, this, this, uh, making a decision which countries you want to go into. And that, uh, of course, depends upon uh, what type of licensee or what type of country that you think your product would be there. On the licensing of international, you can license it anywhere. Like uh, it, you just have to determine which territory you are licensing that. Uh, of course, if it's a patent, wherever your patent is there, it makes more value uh, to uh, license that. Uh, if it's know-how, it can be uh, anywhere uh, so long you uh, make your know-how so valuable. So that's what I would see. Hope that's clear. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Sunil Kumar, Savita sir has even asked that whether the IP disputes will be filed in civil court or consumer affairs court. I'm not sure about what is happening in India. Of course, uh, uh, okay, Vijayasi is like uh, he has explained civil courts. All IP matters are civil litigations. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. For apprising us with the different uh, aspects of uh, technology licensing. Now I call upon Professor Ujwala Shinde, ma'am, the coordinator of our FDP, to felicitate our speaker, Ms. Polomi Ghosh, ma'am. Ma'am. Hi. Hi. Hi, Dr. Ujwala. Yeah, hi, Polomi. And uh, thank you, Polomi, for taking time to connect with us overseas and explaining uh, that having oh, a patent pleasure. and having my pleasure. patented product are the two different things, licensing procedures with case studies to our pass uh, participants. Uh, we really extend our thanks for your valuable time with a green token of appreciation, which our research scholar have planted a sapling of Parijat in our BCP uh, green campus. Uh, uh, you can just see that. Uh, Harshali, could you play the video? This is the theme of our FDP, Innovation Management. So whenever you come to Mumbai, do come, do visit to Bombay College of Pharmacy. We'll show you the plant. No, that's really good. That's good. Yeah. That's quite a yeah. Thank yeah. you. As your remembrance, we are association with our FDP. Please uh, take our e certificate of appreciation.